Well, it is 11 o'clock, so we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, so so first, um, good morning and welcome um, to all um, to our first quarterly distillation of 2021, brought to you by our good friends at Beta Rudder. We have a fantastic guest star today um, with Megan Hurley from Farmer's Fridge. So thank you all for being a part of our virtual events. Um, as many of you know, I'm Alan Reed, the Executive Director of the Chicagoland Food and Beverage Network. Those of you who don't know Chicagoland Food and Beverage Network, we are an almost four-year-old mission-driven industry organization. We bring together the incredible food and beverage industry of the greater Chicagoland area. That is 4,500 companies, by the way, um, and 130,000 employees um, to grow the industry, drive innovation, grow our incredible local economy, um, and create jobs. Those things are important every day. They're even more important in the midst of a global pandemic. Um, and I'll say after a global pandemic, we are putting on, are you ready, 30 something, I think 32 or three um, virtual events this year. Our members all get to see those for free. Um, and we encourage you to become um, a member today. Um, feel free to reach out to any of us or, or quickly um, go to our website at chicagolandfood.org and find out more about membership. We also, oh, and a thank you to our Cornerstone members and our industry premium members and our, oh, wow, Wells Fargo gets their own slide. That's awesome. The, um, <laughs> it's probably an odd number there, but we, uh, we are proud to have 125 um, corporate members um, and many, many, many individual members as well, um, as well as great partners and funding partners without whom we could not do the work that we do. Um, we also have a sister organization called Bigger Table. Bigger Table brings together that same incredible Chicagoland food and beverage um, industry to address issues challenging our local communities. Um, we're focusing on food insecurity, unemployment, and inclusive economic development. We are literally right now um, just about to produce another 300,000 servings of healthy food um, that will be donated to area food banks um, to help them um, help their community um, throughout um, this incredible ongoing global pandemic. If you want to know more about that um, or donate to our cause, please take a look at biggertable.org. By the way, um, our, th that beautiful website you'll see at biggertable.org was designed by our good friends at Beta Rudder, um, who have been absolutely just instrumental in moving, um, moving Bigger Table's mission forward. We love it when you get social um, and uh, some are probably watching through LinkedIn Live. Welcome, we're glad you're here. Um, feel free to comment with us and bring this, bring the conversation here onto social media through any of our fantastic, um, through our fantastic channels. Um, and by the way, for those of you, oh, um, those, for those of you um, here in the, in the Zoom chat, feel free to um, use the chat or Q&A features to um, put questions together for, um, for Megan and the Beta Rudder um, um, Intel Distillery team. So you don't even have to remember and raise your hand. You can just put them right into the chat and we'll do our very best to make sure that they get, that they get addressed. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dennis Ryan to introduce our amazing guest star. Thank you, Alan. Yes, yeah, as, as you can see right there, we're really pleased to have Megan Hurley. She's the head of brand marketing at Farmers Fridge, and she's going to join us today to talk about how the company has been adapting to the pandemic and also how they'll be scaling up their line of delicious and very, very fresh offerings in a national deal that was announced just recently with Duncan. So that's actually a really interesting story. We're interested in hearing what she has to say about that. Welcome to the first uh, first installment of the quarterly distillations. Um, we'll be doing these webinars every, and you guessed it, every quarter. And we're just gonna do what we've done before. We review the trending topics in the food industry. What's happening, who's driving what, and, and what's really being talked about up and down the food supply chain. If you subscribe to the Intel Distillery, you know we've already released our 2020 top 10 topics year in review. And we dubbed that wrap up report the COVID shuffle for obvious reasons. In addition to top lining everything that we said, the top 10 topics of the year, we also talked a little bit about one of the very few silver linings of the COVID epidemic and pandemic. Gotta get my demics right. 
the pandemic, which was really this growing um, awareness and focus on corporate CSR, uh, these programs. More companies are stepping up and doing more for the public good, particularly in relation to food insecurity and uh, attention to the critical role of food industry workers. So we track the escalation of that through the year. It's kept growing and it shows no signs of slowing in 2021. So I'm gonna put links in the chat. If you'd like to follow us, if you'd like to uh, subscribe or download that report, you can find it all in the chat. Uh, there you go. And if you subscribe, you'll get all this magic delivered to you once a week directly to your inbox. So there's that. You know, one of the biggest things as marketers we're talking about is this weekend's big game. You know, it's euphemistically called by people who don't pony up and pay the money to sponsor. This year, the price for 30 seconds has actually dropped $100,000 to a mere $5.5 million. You make those checks payable to CVS and you can put whatever you want on for half hour as long as they approve it, half a minute. But again, food brands, actually food and beverage brands are making a big deal this year. We've already seen some teasers and actually the actual ads from people like Frito-Lay, who's got a bevy of NFL stars. M&M, which is actually, we haven't seen this yet, and it stars Dan Levy of Schitt's Creek fame, the only other guy with eyebrows thicker than me. Uh, we got John Cena making an appearance for Mountain Dew, Wayne and Garth come back for Uber Eats. Amy Schumer is doing something for Hellman's Mayonnaise, and it's just interesting to see a condiment brand in there. We find that fun. Doritos is doing a big deal with Mindy Kaling and Jimmy Kimmel and Matthew McConaughey. Cheetos is Myla Kunis and Ashton Kutcher. There's a Pringles ad with nobody famous. Imagine that. Um, Bud Light has got some ads. Michelob Ultra has a very big ad, which is actually kind of interesting. But the one that really hit us so far has been Chipotle, which asked the question, can a burrito save the world, change the world? And it's interesting. They do what we speak of a lot at Beta Rudder, which is turn to the food production, the food uh, uh, the food, what am I saying? The food supply chain to find the stories that actually consumers find relevant. How do you get your food? Chipotle makes a big deal out of that in the show. Interestingly, Budweiser, who's been in this, uh, who's had a, an ad every year since 1983, will not be in this Super Bowl. They have instead decided to put that money against, frankly, trying to promote vaccines for COVID-19. Make sure people get their vaccine and more importantly to the brand, get back to the bars and the on-premise things that form such a major part of their business. So it's a vested, vested interest they have in getting people vaccinated and back to real life. Also, Pepsi is not doing a Pepsi brand one, although they are still sponsoring the halftime show. So a lot of interesting things we'll be talking about this weekend and uh, it should be a lot of fun as it generally is. Now I'm going to turn it over to Nick, who will take a quick look back at 2020 and the top 10 topics. Nick? Thanks a lot, Dennis. Uh, great overview there of, uh, you know, what's in the immediate future. I guess we're going to shift gears a whole bunch here and talk about 2020. When we started doing these webinars, you know, we were going at weekly increments, just trying to figure out what happened um, throughout as the pandemic settled in. But now I think we have a whole year's worth of analysis. Just wanted to... Um, Take a quick look and you know see what uh, what la what 2020 meant. And as Dennis mentioned, um, you, know, you could read about all of this in the report. But I I will just look at some of the um, top line observations. And just as a refresher for those that may not know, um, our system of uh, Beta Rudder's Intel Distillery kind of counts words by the most influential voices throughout food, beverage, and agriculture. So that way. We count what the words are by and about these most influential voices, and that gives us a um, quantitative tally of kind of what's happening in the industry. Um, just for a couple quick examples, a few years ago, GMOs was like the biggest conversation of what people were talking about, legislation and safety and regulation. You know, usually like the, the, the weather will creep in in the third quarter because of uh, harvest and droughts, things like that. Um, when the Trump administration took over um, four years ago, international trade became one of the top topics because that was the focus um, of that administration. And that trickled down into food in terms of, you know, crop and animal agriculture exports and stuff like that and kind of set the tone for the whole um, stage. So um, 
we did that, we, you know, as most years we counted, um, you know, top conversations in 2020. And do you have the slide, Dennis, for uh, the dominance of COVID? We wanted to figure out, you know, we kept a tally throughout the year of how dominant the COVID conversation ver was versus everything else. Um, we've had a few very, you know, dominant conversations in the time that we've been doing this. You know, some things like M McDonald's all day breakfast or um, Amazon buying uh, foods or the government shutdown um, a couple years ago. Those really commanded the conversation, but those all paled in comparison to how much the influential voices we track discussed the coronavirus. So in one way or another, in the beginning of April, you know, well over 60% of people discussed, you know, had the coronavirus bled into those conversations. It eventually tapered off, but has uh, you know, remained such a huge and dominant part of the conversation um, overall about food and beverage. Um, so, you know, we, as the pandemic settled in, you know, just looking back at the whole year, we really wondered how this would materialize in the way we count things. And if we look at kind of the bigger picture throughout the year, uh, this is our trends chart here, just showing how the top topics interacted with one another. Uh, two topics really stood out throughout the year, you know, heads and above the others, which were very much um, quiet in the past. Um, the workforce and hunger, two of the things that the bigger table um, uh, nonprofit is addressing. You know, these two topics really kind of came out of, I, I hesitate to say obscurity, but they were really never weighed in. Um, as heavily as they did throughout 2020. And this was a direct impact um, of, the, um, of, of, of the coronavirus. So like what kind of conversations made these up? We could look real quick at the conversation on hunger, you know, uh, throughout, um, you know, the food and beverage voices, uh, I'd keep it on the one up, up there, Dennis. Um, mass unemployment, you know, led to a sharp increase in food insecurity. You know, the uh, broken supply chains, economic instability, um, unemployment uh, kind of contributed to why that, why um, hunger be, was the number two topic. Um, if you look at the Feeding America website, they keep a great running tally of kind of the large macro impact of what this means. You know, they, they estimated that at some point throughout 2020, 50 million people, including 17 million children nationwide, experienced hunger at some time throughout the year. And that's up from 35 million and 12 million respectively uh, the year prior. So those are huge numbers. Um, the government stepped in, you know, some of the bigger conversations also wrapped up in this were like the, uh, the USDA and the government stepping in with something called the Farms to Families uh, Food Box. And you know that was kind of widely criticized, and most food groups and uh, um, other uh, other influential voices were just saying, you know, let's step up uh, food stamps and uh, SNAP efforts. Um, you know, but the silver lining to this, you know, many uh, food companies are in such a unique position to mitigate this hunger in donating food and hunger relief and supply chain talent to kind of to, to do what they could to mitigate some of those numbers. So, you know, many big manufacturers and uh, grocery stores and other channels pitched in to uh, solve that problem. The number one topic, the workforce, if you could see from this graphic here, it dramatically, I mean, it, you know, in years past, it was our 29th topic, 20th, 24th, 20, blah, blah, blah. Um, it shot up to the, you know, number one topic. And that was, you know, persistent through many quarters. Um, you know, we could just say that, the, you know, the, um, you know, one way to put it would that um, 2020 kind of cracked the foundation of all of food production. You know, food, the workforce is so critical to farms and factories and food service and grocery. And at all levels, there is a major disruption. You know, it really got catapulted to the number one spot throughout the year. You know, conversations about hazard pay, food processing workers in close proximity, paycheck protection, uh, troubles accessing um, unemployment benefits, those all persisted throughout the year. Um, eventually the conversation shifted to vaccines with industry groups, you know, pressing hard to get those frontline workers uh, vaccinated as soon as possible. So that was, that was the, you know, the COVID shuffle Dennis alluded to. This is how, you know, at least by our count, how the conversation um, 
uh, got rattled this year as we track things. So you know, that was kind of the looking back portion. Kyle Church is going to take over now and just talk about, you know, what a new administration might mean to some of these larger policy issues. Thanks, Nick. Um, so uh, with the new Biden administration coming in, we've seen a lot of shifts in policy, um, not just because it's the other side of the aisle, but also just different approaches to what role the government should play, particularly in responses to the pandemic. Um, so President Biden came in and has really done a lot in his first two weeks. He's set a record for the number of executive orders and executive actions broadly in the first two weeks of the administration. Um, we've seen about 42 executive actions um, at the last count that I saw. And of those, eight of them directly tied to food and agriculture and several others will have trickling effects into um, you know, how the workforce, how um, different regulations, scientific um, studies and such will play out under this administration. Um, with the larger um, coronavirus relief packages and goals set by the Biden administration, we expect to see uh, OSHA kick up its, its um, stance in this whole thing. So they were largely hands off and had only issued a couple of fines um, throughout the early parts of the pandemic. And we expect to see that ramping up a lot with Biden's encouragement, um, particularly as he requests that that agency actually set standards for um, what companies can do for their, or require of their workers and what they have to do to make their workers safe. Um, so that will, that certainly, I mean, that affects everyone across the board, but particularly um, for the larger employers and for places like um, processing facilities and even for um, places like grocers and restaurants, how do you ensure that people with contact with lots of customers who might pose a greater risk, how do you factor that into your business? Um, additionally, um, Biden issued a couple executive um, actions pertaining to hunger, and he increased food stamp uh, benefits as well as the pandemic EBT benefits. Um, the goal there was to increase those uh, availability by 15% and to reassess how some of the um, nutrition um, factors into how much a benefit each person will get each month. Um, and he also worked to make school meals a little bit more accessible or directed the agencies to make them more accessible. This has definitely been um, a topic that uh, it's, it's largely up to states, but the um, USDA plays a large role in the, the food, the school meal programs. Um, so, all of this is still vague at the moment. It is just President Biden saying, I want to make this a focus, but it is certainly guiding what will happen over the coming months and certainly as the pandemic continues to play out. We've also seen a couple other priorities emerge that are not directly pandemic related. So um, Biden certainly has a lot of support from unions and from uh, kind of workers' rights groups and He's um, pushing for a $15 an hour minimum wage that has certainly come up in Congress already, though the likelihood of that is not uh, super firm, just because it's not, it's not something that appeals to uh, both sides of the aisle. And it is also something that goes over better in, say, urban places where wages are already currently much higher, whereas the current federal minimum is $7, $7.25, I believe, an hour. Um, Additionally, uh, there's a larger focus on environment under the Biden administration. And he's really turned to using agriculture and farming practices as uh, a carbon set, or carbon offset, sorry. Um, so with certain practices, we can reduce carbon in the atmosphere based on what you're doing with how you farm. And He's trying to encourage that, and the farm groups have largely bought into this because farmers are the stewards of the earth. This is, this is something that they take pride in across the board, whether, whether different groups have different opinions about what is particularly more sustainable, farmers take pride in what they do for the land because it is what they pass on to future generations. And so they are embracing the Biden administration's push to make this a stronger tenet of what the government does in the food production system. Um, however, 
what we haven't heard much about so far is how the Biden administration will look at, um, say, health policies. So the Trump administration just published the dietary guidelines at the end of last year, and that is unlikely to change until five years from now. Um, but how much of an emphasis uh, school meals get can certainly play a large role in the Biden administration. And one of the things we reflected on is under the Obama administration, when um, Biden was vice president, we saw that there was a big push with the Partnership for Healthy America and the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act to foster public private partnerships. And certainly under the Trump administration, administration we saw a lot more private partnerships to take health more to the forefront. And with Farmer, Farmers Fridge's latest partnership, uh, we kind of remember the most recent like big partnership that would be on the same scale was basically when Partnership for Healthy America got everyone put bananas in like convenience stores at like your local Exxon or 7-Eleven. So uh, it, it's been a cool development. And with that, we're happy to turn it over to Megan Hurley so she can talk about their role in helping uh, develop these systems and partnerships. Hi. Um, so yeah, we just kicked off a partnership with Duncan um, and it was kind of, um, it was interesting as a, I worked at Starbucks and Pete's Coffee um, in my past. And so I'm not, uh, and I'm a Midwesterner, so I'm not the biggest Duncan person. Um, but it was, you know, somebody was like, I know somebody you really need to work with. And it was Dunkin' Donuts. So Farmers Rich and Dunkin' Donuts kicked off a partnership. It's now um, in its fourth week. Um, and we, so it's just a pilot in three Chicago stores and three New Jersey stores. And we did a, you know, PR around it. We thought no one was going to care. Um, and it ended up getting a ton of press because this is crazy interesting. Like people are like, how are salads and this food accessible at a Dunkin' Donuts? And when you think about it, our items, like the way people find out about our brand, really our number one thing is through airports. Um, which to me is the same thing as a drive-through. And so when you're looking for something that's easy to, to grab and go, um, that also covers a meal, um, you, you know, Farmer's Fridge is the answer to that. So with the increase in drive-throughs and Dunkin' Donuts trying to grab more um, opportunity and more meal times, um, the partnership really makes sense. From a brand perspective, it's like donuts and salads? That sounds crazy. Um, but so far it's been really uh, fun and exciting. Um, they carry some of our salads and bowls and then also some of our breakfast items like our parfaits and our oats. So I run marketing at Farmer's Fridge and I started about a year and a half ago. So I was here, I came on to launch fridges in the Northeast, basically. Um, fridge company, I'd worked at Trunk Club before we had a fridge. I've been obsessed with Farmer's Fridge. Actually, we used to um, sell cookie dough in our fridges. And when I was pregnant with my first child, I was like, cookie dough for pregnant ladies? This is amazing. What is this company? Um, I think Luke, our founder, would die if I talked about cookie dough now, but it was my first um, step into Farmer's Fridge. So being in the food industry, I had always really been, ex you know, paying attention to Farmer's Fridge, but also um, just overall interested in everything that they were doing as far as bringing healthy food um, to the masses. And so I took a brief step off of food and worked at Trunk Club for a year and a half, as I mentioned. And then really just missed, I'm just such a Midwest kid. I grew up with my dad owning food distributors. Um, and so really wanted to get back into the food world. Um, so started Farmer's Fridge promoting fridges. And I was like, this is gonna be great. I love this product. And then about six months in, um, we went through March as everybody did um, the, you know, Friday the 13th, where everyone was like, stay at home and don't go out ever. Um, and so we, when we did that, um, we had lost about 70 to 80% of our business within a week because it really affected the Northeast um, first and then hit Chicago. So we're in a lot of offices and airports. Um, so of course, everybody was working from home um, and then no one was traveling. And so it really impacted us. We're all at home, um, some of us with our kids and husbands or significant others working from my closets and had no idea what to do. Um, we had always been interested in doing in you know opening other channels like ecom um but it just wasn't on our roadmap not even for 2020 and so we were like do we launch it i mean do we just start doing delivery to homes um we already had because we're vertically integrated we make all our own food 
um, and we have our own delivery and logistics system. So it was really just about turning all our night owls into daytime drivers, um, dropping off at homes instead of you know filling in fridges, um, and you know figuring out from a marketing perspective and a tech perspective how you turn on an online store. Um, so we did that, and I remember um, because I had e ecom background in Trunk Club, it was like I had to dig back into that world of like how do I do this, and I still remember watching Facebook and saying like, it are, cause that was where we first went with our advertising. I was like, do, are we gonna get one customer that's not my mom? And <laughs> all of our friends that we were like, all of us actually, we were missing our food. So it was farmer's fridge employees. And it was just like, how do we do this? And so what we saw is um, it really started to take off. So we offered delivery in Chicago and New York um, and it just started to build and build um, throughout the year, which was really exciting. Um, and we offer, um, we started to expand our offering. So we launched a new um, meal time, but also, you know, kind of you can eat at any time called plates, um, where it's not just salads um, and it's more of an expanded offering of our bowls. Um, so there's like a enchilada and a, a French braised chicken, which is a little bit different than the salad offerings that we usually have in our fridges. Um, so my team actually launched that. A lot of people are like, cool, farmer's fridge checks the box. Well, then all of a sudden we're like, we have fridges, kind of. Some of them are still online. The airports are still there. Then we have this delivery e-com channel. And then we started getting interest. Well, we had already had interest from hospitals um, to do wholesale. Um, and the main reason was because as COVID was hitting New York, they didn't want doctors or nurses moving between floors. So they're like, we'll bring your food to you and you're not allowed to leave kind of your floor. Um, so we worked with hospitals in the Northeast and then started working with hospitals in the Midwest and then expanded that also to colleges where they were really trying to limit the uh, movements of students um, into you know, just their dorm and then a grab and go option where they can eat in their dorm room. And so we saw then you know, fridges <laughs> to the channel of e-com and now a whole nother channel with wholesale, which is really where that Duncan partnership um, and retail kind of came out of. So the ability to start doing, because we own all of our own logistics, um, we were able to be really flexible. Um, and now we have really a flexible service model in all the areas that we're in. Well, I just wanna say congratulations on, <laughs> on successful, really, really big pivots. Yeah. Um, it's so awesome. I've, um, I'm, I'm a fan of Farmer's Fridge and have been for a very, very long time. Great stuff, again, congratulations on figuring that out. Um, and you know, that kind of just just ingenuity and um, and I'll say just just grit to pull through a difficult situation. <laughs> it was like, it felt like it was hard. <laughs> oh, I, I can only imagine. <laughs> I think grit's a good way. Looking back, it was grit. Um, in the moment, it was like, oh my God, <laughs> which I'm sure That's, everybody felt. Again, just, just awesome. And again, I think it's, uh, um, and it's on in the comments. It's just, it's a really provocative pairing. Um, and it's one of those things where, where I probably wouldn't go through a Dunkin' Donuts very, very often, but I would consider it just because it's, it really changes the way I, I think of Dunkin', right? Um, yeah. It's just terrific and smart, and I wish you all the best of luck. Thank you. We're excited. Megan, given these major changes you made, both serving hospitals, moving into colleges, in addition to the Duncan thing, but what's been the bigger part of that challenge? Has it been the literally just making the, the salads and different things, or is it the delivery mechanism, which is the hardest part as you're making these adjustments, the biggest um, challenge? I mean, not to like make all, everything a marketing problem, but our ops team is really flat, like they just, they really didn't have to pivot too much. They just had to adjust kind of how much we made and when we made it. Yeah. Um, and so, and and then they, you know, obviously had to launch plates, but their system was so well done that they were, you know, when this pandemic hit, they're like, we're good. And then our tech team, I feel like is similar. Like they're just like, okay, we'll just pivot to that. For marketing, we had a, and are still building, like what is our offering in whole, like we are, I was focused on fridges and branding fridges and talking about fridges and B2B fridging things. And now <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, we're a fresh CPG and we have a partnership with Duncan. And how do you make sure your voice um, stands out and all of that when really we were just starting to talk about our North Star in marketing and 
we had just had a huge partnership with Macy's at the beginning. And so last year at this time, my team were all in New York at Macy's with a fridge pop up and we we're so excited. And now you look back and you're like, the entire retail industry is decimated and like who knows where that, you know, like what happened to that part of Macy's. And so I think that's, it's, that was, is still really hard is figuring out our message and our customer and um, what people uh, love about us and how we kind of flex in all these different areas. There's a couple of questions coming in uh, over the wires, as they say. Um, I'm going to combine <laughs> two of them here. Um, kind of relating to what's going to happen later, right? So when we're on the other side of this, do you have different teams that will manage the fridges slash home delivery slash wholesale areas? Will any areas fall off or you do or do you anticipate um, all three continuing and growing post pandemic? Um, we so I'll take the second part first. We do anticipate everything growing post pandemic. I do think um, I've been at omnichannel companies before and I do think it's nice um, to, you know, spread out your uh, bets a little bit. So I personally like the idea of being omnichannel, no, though it's really hard on my team to kind of figure out the messaging and the prioritization. Um, the second part, as far as building a team, I feel like maybe someone on my team asked that question, um, but I, we are still trying to figure it out. I'm used to, um, I've been in a bunch of different marketing models and a whole bunch of different company models. And as a company, but also as a marketing team, we're trying to really understand like how much work is supporting wholesale, how much work is supporting B2B opportunities, um, really not losing sight of how important brand is. Um, so I, we're going through that exercise right now, but it's a great question because there's so, um, just marketing changes so much. And then as our company has become omnichannel, it's like, what do you use agencies to help you with? Um, I'm sure, I don't know how much everybody knows, but the iOS 14 update and how impactful that's going to be on digital marketing keeps me up at night. And it's like what I doom scroll now is the fights between Mark Zuckerberg and Tim Cook. And so to me, that's like trying to figure out, is that something we keep in house, which we do now? Um, we do do all of our own media buying, um, or is that something we work with an agency to support? Um, and so we're going through all of that right now. I don't really have a good answer. I just have all, my doom scrolling and panic talking, which you guys have just witnessed. So. <laughs> Pretty great. Well, you could pivot quickly, right? React quickly to what happens. Another question. There's a there's there's a bunch. What um, here's a follow up from a different person. Do you see opportunities to increase consumer loyalty by telling stories from your supply chain and about how you source your products? I guess your your products and ingredients. Yeah. Um, it seems like an amazing power in pro in Farmers Ridge to be a convenient, nutritious, and sustainable brand. Yes, we have um, we have done some storytelling, and I think there's a lot of opportunity there. I um, previously worked at Whole Foods um, and just was there when we really launched all the local um, partnerships and local storytelling. And I know how and how wonderful it is for a brand, but also how impactful it is for to tell a grower story or a um, another local company story and use our platform to do that. Um, so yes, we, we used to tell those stories last year. I think we're all still figuring out how to see people. Um, and so this year they're back on the docket and we've been working with a lot of local chefs, which has helped us, um, to tell some stories on, you know, the restaurant behalf. Cool. There's one in the history category. Um, how did you get involved with Duncan? Uh, honestly, it's like, I know a guy and he really like <laughs> thinks the partnership with Duncan would work. So I think um, it really came through our advisors was like, I just, Duncan might be a perfect match. Um, and so connected us with Duncan and then our, um, our fantastic sales team really kind of connected with them. Um, and the deal was done by the time they contacted marketing, which is how I like it. Um, <laughs> and so, um, and then we just started working with their team, which has been really great. Very smooth, good. Really cool. Oh, another one just popped in. Given the likely success at Duncan, where do you expect to expand next? Um, everywhere. No, do you know somebody? Um, yeah. I there. So we, um, honestly, we are looking at all, like kind of the world just 
opened up to us. Um, we're really starting to develop our menu um, to meet a bunch of different options. Um, we're working on, you know, smaller side items, um, stuff that makes more sense for airports that aren't just um, our fridges. So we're kind of going through all of that right now and seeing where um, who's interested um, as we really started to develop stuff. So Duncan's been really great. Of course, we would love to be in grocery. Um, we would love some more um, QSR partners. And honestly, I just, I, um, I love farmers. For, like, so I really like our brand, but I also really like our product. So I would like us, like last year, we took a road trip to visit family in Connecticut and we took farmer's fridge on the way there. And like, it was so wonderful to be able to eat that food. And then on the way back, we like kind of made different decisions about food. And I was just like, yeah, man, right. I really, like you don't know what you have until it's gone. And so I just, I really feel that there's an opportunity um, for farmer's fridge to be every, everywhere. And there's so much technology around um, refrigeration now that I do feel like that opportunity is just um, immense. Also scary, but like, I, I kind of feel like we could be on that highway to Connecticut um, soon. What What's the current geography again? Is it Chicago, um, Milwaukee, New York? Yeah. So okay. we have, yeah, so we, and then New Jersey, Philly. Right, okay. Yeah. And Indiana, sorry, did I forget Indianapolis? Lovely city, don't wanna forget them. <laughs> Indeed. Optimistic question, how do we invest in farmer's fridge? That's a vote of confidence. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we're private, so come and be an employee and you can get some <laughs> options. <laughs> That's a good one. And then an anonymous attendee Ooh. is asking, uh, where do you see Farmer's Fridge sourcing its volume from? I, I can see that answer going many different ways. So. Um, that is probably not a question best answered by me. That's not at all my expertise. Yep. Um, but I hope really wonderful people so I can tell their stories. So I, I, the, I know the team does some really great um, sourcing work um, and really makes our, our menu flexible so that we can uh, make sure that it's, you know, everything that we're doing is super fresh. Um, and I'm not giving the best answer because this is not my expertise, but I can get back to you if you come out of anonymous and email me and I'll get you the right answer. So, I'll tell you if they uh, if they pop up here. Yeah. So I, I'm gonna just I'm gonna redirect there just a yeah. just a tiny bit. I think they're asking who are you taking your volume from currently? Oh so can, oh oh oh! Like who's our competitors? Good point. Good point. Yeah. So um, so, yeah. So um, you, you nicely referred to you know what what did you eat from on the side of the road to uh, yeah. um from Connecticut? So yeah. if you have farmer's fridge, does that mean you're not going to parties? Yeah, McDonald's, yeah. Hardee's, um, Arby's, whichever. Yeah, I do think that that's some of it, but I also feel like um, a lot of it, and then speaking from my own uh, personal experience, is um, the snacks that you would make a meal. So like the Cliff Bar, and, and that's really, um, those ideas is why Luke started this company in the first place. Like he was eating, you know, popcorn and cliff bars on the road. Um, and if you travel a lot, that's what you, like I grab, I used to always grab like some kind of energy bar and then go on my flights out to California that I was taking every other week. Um, and so I think we actually replace that. We make, you know, we give you a meal that you weren't otherwise able to get. Um, same with on the road. So I, I do the same thing. So I think that's probably you know, where we are most competitive right now. Um, but in the, in, you know, there, of course, um, our competitors out there, like a Panera or a McDonald's is really whatever other opportunities um, there are for meal times. One more question came in. Um, I know Duncan is part of this movement, but someone is asking, how does, how is Fresh Farms viewing the plant-based foods movement? Do you or will you be selling plant-based uh, meats and quotes, for example? Um, I don't know. Um, I, I can't answer that. I know the team's often looking at different ideas. Um, we have sold tofu um, in some of our items. So we just worked with Stephanie Izzard and had tofu in that um, um, bowl. Um, but as far as alternative meats or plant-based meats, we um, don't have any um, on the plan right now. But yeah, Duncan has Beyond Meat, so. They do the sausage yeah. patty yeah. sandwich, I think. Yeah, yes. okay. Um, 
Being in Chicago and other large cities, has Farmers Fudge put any thought into the food deserts and in inner cities? Um, we have. Um, so we, my team works really closely with a lot of the communities and trying to make sure that we're giving them, um, meeting their needs with free meals. Um, and so we do a lot of work with charities and, and charitable giving, which is awesome. Um, and I think in the 2020, we gave about 100,000 meals away um, with the help of some of our investors as well. Um, so that was great. But I also think that there is a huge opportunity to just create um, um, spaces like our fridges and are making our food more accessible. And so the model is actually built to do that. And so right now we're working on different value menu items, different ways to make sure that, well, wherever you are, so we feel this with food too, like wherever you are at your food journey, we wanna meet you. And um, wherever you are in your financial journey or what you can afford, we wanna meet you there as well. So um, there's a lot of work internally to make sure that we are working towards um, creating a sustainable model um, in food deserts um, and in, in you know, throughout um, all of the food areas, making sure that our food is accessible and priced at a, at a normal price. Excellent. So many good questions today. Um, I think we're going to, if it's okay, we're going to do, there's two more in the, uh, in the bank here. We'll do these two and then, uh, you know, we can always follow up later. This has been so great with all these, all the questions. There's just such an interesting offer you have. Um, so uh, one of two, since you have, since you have such fresh product, does it need to be produced and packaged within a given geographical area? Um, it does. Uh, we produce everything in Chicago um, and we uh, actually make everything in a really cold room. Um, I've worked in it and it took me like four days to recover um, and feel my limbs again. Um, but that that managing of the cold chain really helps with keeping items um, fresh. So um, yeah, it does have to be within a certain geo. Yep. And then do you partner directly with farmers? Um, we do partner directly with farmers, um, not on all of our items, um, but we do have um, like local apples, local blueberries. Um, and so we'll work on a lot of the seasonal um, items with uh, local Midwest farmers. Awesome. Such great questions today. Yeah. You know, so good. Except and the volume one really stressed me out. I was like, I don't know. Um, yeah, but besides that, everything was great. And Megan, we were pitching them at you fast. So thanks, thanks so much for being a good sport and just sort of being, I'll say, just being terrific and candid and letting us know like the great stuff um, going on with Farmers Fridge. Everybody in Chicago and and anybody who's ever had your product, I know is rooting for you. Um, and again, so terrific to see, like I say, such amazing pivoting. Um, like that's that's really what I'm walking away with is is. Anybody that works this hard to get people delicious, healthy food is going to be around for a uh, for a really long time. Um, and while I love your vending, like your your fridges themselves, so exciting to see the product showing up in in delivery in in QSR. Um, hopefully, some more in CPG. Hopefully, we can start to see it. You'll be, you'll be a multi-channel darling before. Uh, um, before too much longer. So thank you so much for everything today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Intel Distillery team for your brilliant insights. Um, amazing as always. For those of you who aren't yet signed up for the Intel Distillery, their um, Friday before noon um, um, newsletter is, it is worth its weight in gold. Shown to us by the beautiful Dennis Ryan. There you go. Um, thank you, Vanna. Like the, <laughs> the, uh, I mean, just, it will keep you on top of what's happening in the industry. There's so much and it's so hard to stay on top of it. Um, but they do such a great job of keeping, uh, keeping all of us and keeping industry on top of really just up to the minute on the most important stuff that's going on in our industry. So thank you all for attending. We hope to see you at other at other events. We do have, again, 30 something of them we're putting on this year. We will see this team back on, well, in a quarter. I can't remember the exact dates, but they're around Couple somewhere. Months. We look yep. forward to it. Um, everyone have a terrific, terrific day. 
Um, and thanks for staying connected.